Uh, welcome to the 52nd theoretical physics colloquium by Professor George Naronia from University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. He got his PhD at Goethe University in Frankfurt in 2007. Afterwards, he has been a postdoctoral research scientist at Columbia University for three years until 2011. From 2011 until 2019, he was a faculty at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. Since 2019, he's an associate professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And since 2020, from July 2020, he is an associate director of the Illinois Center for Advanced Studies of the Universe at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, over the years, he uh, had some honors and distinctions. Uh, in 2008, he got the Gennaro and Frank uh, Caring Prize, which is the best physics PhD thesis of the year from Goethe University in Frankfurt. In 2015, he was elected affiliate member of the Brazilian Academy of Sciences. His research interests include holographic duality and its applications to strongly coupled gauge theories relativistic fluid dynamics and kinetics theory in curved space-time, quantum chromodynamics at finite temperature and density, including uh, studies in heavy ion collisions and neutron stars. And today he will be talking about deconstructing relativistic fluid dynamics. And with that, I'll give the microphone to George. Very good. Thanks a lot, Igor, for this nice introduction. And I'm very happy to be here. Um, I've been, you know, following these colloquia since they started, but, um, you know, almost together at the same time as the pandemic, right, I guess. Um, so, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about relativistic fluid dynamics and several uh, interesting uh, new developments that appeared that could have consequences to uh, high energy nuclear physics and also astrophysics. Okay, oh, wait, is it working? Yes. Okay, so... First, uh, there's this general statement, fluid dynamics can be seen everywhere. In fact, everywhere in here around me, um, we have fluids and around you as well. So, but why are, you know, um, why can't you see, why can't you see fluid dynamics, you know, pretty much everywhere? Because a very general type of phenomenon that is based on conservation laws, for example, conservation of mass non-relativistically or conservation of energy momentum, uh, as we understand later here at relativistically. Also, so the idea is that you have these conservation laws and also the hypothesis or you know, this fluid dynamics occurs when you have this very large separation of land scales. So the land scales, you could have a microscopic land scale, this capital L here, associated with the gradients um, of quantities that you normally uh, see here, for example, for the velocity of the air here, when I do this with my hand, while the microscopic scale will be associated, for example, in the case of this gas with the mean free path uh, for the molecules to collide here in this little gas here in the air. In general, we call this a fluid uh, when the ratio between this little scale and the big scale is very, very, very small, much smaller than one. This thing, we call it a Knudsen number. And when that happens, normally we have a fluid. And examples of fluid, of course, you see here on, at the planetary scale of the Earth and also here at the scale of a car, just the no normal human size. How does one describe fluid dynamics? Um, you have to use, for example, in the normal relativistic regime, use the conservation of mass, use Newton's second law. You could, you, you could also add isotropy and compressibility, and you end up with an equation that is very famous. Um, oh, sorry. There's an equation that is very famous that tells you how the velocity of the fluid varies in, in time and in space. This is the pressure of the fluid, this is the density, and this part it's called the ideal fluid part. That's the part when the fluid evolves, there's no dissipation. There's no entropy being produced here locally. But how, uh, however, um, if you actually go beyond just the ideal fluid approximation, there's another piece, this, right, this piece here on the right-hand side that you normally try to understand as a series in this Knudsen number. So when the Knudsen number is very, very, very small going to zero, this viscous part is not important, this eta here is the shear viscosity. As the viscosity gets more important, this right-hand side becomes important for your evolution. And you see the difference, for example, between the evolution of water or this thing here, this very, very viscous, that looks like honey or something. Uh, these equations are known as the Navier-Stokes equations. They are formally valid when this Knudsen number is very, very small. And you know they are notoriously hard uh, uh, equations to solve if you try to understand them even analytically in three dimensions. Uh, 
In fact, there are several things associated with these equations like turbulence. And also um, there is a millennium prize problem for uh, proving or disproving the global existence and smoothness of the solution of this Navier-Stokes equation. So this is, if you do this, you get a million bucks. But here, we're not gonna talk about that normal relativistic physics. We're gonna talk about the frontiers, the frontiers of fluid dynamics behavior that will take us to the relativistic regime in two conditions. First, in the lab. The first frontier, what I call here in the lab, appears when you redefine what is big, the macroscopic scale now uh, becomes something of the order of the scales that you see in nuclear particle physics. By that, I mean that we're gonna go beyond the atom. So the big scale now is not gonna be even the size of an atom, 10 to the minus 10, but it'll actually go to the size of a nucleus, a large nucleus, or even more. We can even go to the size of a proton. And the scale here is 10 to the minus 15. And one of the big questions that appear in this field is that how can this system, something like a, a, a nucleus or a proton, under what conditions these systems can behave like a fluid, like a liquid here. The other frontier has to do with the large scale. So that will be the frontier in the sky. And this has to do with fluid dynamics under strong gravitational fields that appear in neutron star mergers. As you see here in the simulation, this uh, tells you um, basically what happens to the temperature here, the, the temperature field, and this is the density field in a neutron star merger simulation. So those will be the two frontiers that we're gonna discuss in this talk. So, as I said in this talk, we'll consider both frontiers. And let's start with the frontier defined at very, very small distances, the ones related to the proton, the ones related to quantum chromodynamics. Quantum chromodynamics, as you know, is the fundamental theory of the strong interactions. Uh, it tells you how to describe the interactions between gluons and quarks and the gluons themselves. And there are several uh, uh, fantastic phenomena associated with QCD. Um, one of them, uh, one of the defining properties is asymptotic freedom. And this tells you that the coupling, this is the coupling constant here, the coupling between these quarks and these gluons becomes very small as you keep increasing the, for example, the momentum exchange when these things collide. So in this regime, when the energy is very, very large, the coupling is small and you can do perturbative calculations. This was a fundamental thing that was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2004. Another important part of, of QCD has to do with the QCD vacuum or the strong coupling regime of QCD, where, which is related to the fact that quarks and gluons are never really truly free. So for example, if you try to separate out two quarks that's inside of this little hadron, the pi in here, you have to put so much energy as you try to keep them apart that uh, you end up creating more and more pions. So that's the idea of color confinement, which is a fundamental property that appears in QCD. So um, the, the part of QCD that I'm interested in here has to do with the first with the quark one plasma, which is uh, basically what happens to this quantum chromodynamic matter when the temperature is so large that the degrees of freedom that appear are actually quarks and gluons. They are not just protons and neutrons, they are quarks and gluons. And the first thing that we'll discuss is the idea of quark one plasma in equilibrium. So imagine that you have a box and you put these quarks and gluons, what is the pressure? You can just ask, what is the pressure of this system? This has an answer. So this is the pressure divided by the temperature to the fourth, so this dimensionless, and this is the temperature of the system. And as you keep increasing the temperature, okay, so just for your reference, the pion mass is kind of like here, around 140. As you keep increasing the temperature, the system goes from a hadronic phase that is dominated by hadrons to another phase that has quarks and gluons. And eventually, as you keep increasing the temperature, we'll reach that perturbative regime. So this has a well-defined answer, and this appears when the number of protons and the number of antiprotons is the same. So this is a very important constraint that we'll come back to this later when I discuss neutron star mergers. In this case, there is an answer. But how do you study the out of equilibrium properties of QCD? So this is a question that goes back many decades. Um, so for example, in this uh, paper here, T.D. Lee uh, mentioned, I think already in 1975, that in order to understand what happens to QCD in this regime, you have to think about it differently than um, what you do in particle physics. So in particle physics, you like to put a lot of energy in a very small uh, part of space time. Here, you put a lot of energy in a larger region and you see how this energy flows, okay? And this, uh, and this gives you the idea that in order to, 
actually melt this QCD vacuum that you see here, you have to collide, for example, nuclei that it will put a lot of energy in a lot of, you know, in a decent region of space time. And then you can see how this energy flows. So that's the idea of heavy ion collisions. And this is an example of an event display, for example, from the ATLAS collaboration at CERN. So heavy ion collisions in a nutshell. So the, the idea of the heavy ion collisions is to really to study out of equilibrium QCD phenomena in the laboratory. So this is done at CERN uh, in, in Geneva and also at RIC in New York. And basically the idea is the following. You start with two nuclei. Um, they come at very, very large speeds, very close to the speed of light. That's why they look uh, Lorentz contracted like this. They collide. As they collide, they form this phase, uh, which you will call the quark gluon plasma phase, which is here. This phase, the degrees of freedom are actually quarks and gluons. The system keeps expanding. As it expands, it cools down, and eventually hadrons are formed again, and then it will hit the detector at some point. Uh, one of the interesting properties of this system, the quark gluon plasma, as is forming these experiments, that this is really the hottest. So the temperature is like 10 to the five times larger than the hottest temperature in the sun. The densest, if you actually count the number of particles, is very, very, very dense. The smallest, it's very, very, very small. I mean, uh, for example, when you have two, the collision of two nuclei, this size is not much larger than a few Fermi. Uh, this is like a few times 10 to the minus 15 meters. And one property that was not clear at all when this all started is that this system, this quark gluon plasma, as it evolves in space and time, it behaves like a nearly perfect liquid, a system where the viscous effects are small. In fact, after uh, more than a decade of a collective uh, enterprise throughout the whole field with experiments and theorists, the general conclusion is that this quark gluon plasma behaves like a nearly perfect fluid. This is an emergent property of QCD that was not obvious at all once you actually see, for example, the QCD Lagrangian. And the idea is that this system behaves as a strongly coupled liquid as in the, the viscosity, like this is the shear viscosity, divided by the entropy density is a very, very small number of this order, which could be even a factor of 10 larger than you normally see, for example, for water, which is our standard definition of a liquid. And this appears uh, through precise, very systematic uh, uh, comparisons between uh, calculations involving relativistic hydrodynamics and experimental data. So this is uh, what this plot is here to show. Um, you don't need to focus too much on what this means, but it just tells you uh, this coefficient V2, this coefficient V3 is telling you here how, um, what is the angular distribution of the particles that are formed when the system collides. Um, and the main tool throughout the whole field, really to understand this bulk evolution of the quark gluon plasma is relativistic hydrodynamics. So for example, this is a picture of the energy density of the system what the energy density looks like in the really in the initial state. You see there's a lot of valleys and, and um, some, some structure that appears. So um, one thing that is interesting about this is that if you actually try to compare this eta over S uh, as a function of a temperature. So this TC, uh, don't think about it as a critical temperature, just some, uh, some reference temperature, which in this case is like 150 MeV, like for, almost the mass of the pion. If you try to put this and compare to different systems, for example, like helium or water, um, the extraction, the current, given our current understanding of how to model this system, this quantity eight of rest is actually pretty small. So that's what this little curve here shows. So our general understanding is that this system behaves like a very hot, very dense, uh, relativistic viscous fluids, and we have to model this, where the, visco the viscous effects are, um, the aid of RAS, the, the viscosity divided by the entropy density is small. And we have to model this using uh, relativistic viscous hydrodynamic codes. So um, I just told you about the good things, right? The things that are, have been understood, and I'm assuming that most of you have seen this before. The fact that a quark gluon plasma can be described as a relativistic viscous liquid. But let's try to understand how can that really be possible? I mean, what, what, what are we really doing here? So this goes under the, this phrase that I like very much, which is the unreasonable effectiveness of hydrodynamics and heavy ion collisions. Let's see whether or not this is really unreasonable. 
So the very first thing is how does one describe fluid dynamics in relativity? So now we don't have that simple uh, Navier-Stokes equation that we had in, uh, before that was just the velocity of the fluid in space and time. In space and time, we have to consider a bigger quantity that has all the information that we need in this case, which is the energy momentum tensor. This tells you about the energy density of the system, the energy flux, the momentum flux, the pressure, the shear stress, all the information about how energy and momentum is distributed in your system is contained in this guy, this T mu mu. And uh, the conservation laws, the things that you have to solve are the conservation of energy and momentum. Any decent system should have, oops, any decent system should have this uh, as a divergence of T mu nu equal to zero. But how do you describe this? How do you do, how do you model this T mu nu? Just like we did before, we talked about before in the case of the Navier-Stokes, um, remember that we had a part of the equation that had to do with something that would not produce entropy locally. So there, there was something without any viscosity. And then there was another part that had viscosity. We do the same thing here. So when we write this energy momentum tensor, we write it in terms of variables, which are, for example, the energy density, or it could be the temperature of the system. There is the pressure, which is given in terms of the equation of state, how the pressure is related to the energy density. And um, the flow velocity now becomes a four vector in relativity. And this part, so this has to do with the pressure and the metric of the system. This part is the so-called ideal part. That's the part here that um, would give you the divergence of the entropy current being zero. Okay, so this produces no entropy. Then of course, there's the dissipative part. The dissipative, dissipative part is the rest. Okay, so that's the part that will, the viscosity will appear and this uh, will lead to dissipation. So what do we do in heavy ion collisions? Well, let's try to understand how we could at first justify how hydrodynamics could be uh, applicable. So at first, you know, more than a decade ago, it seemed that hydrodynamics was, you know, indeed justifiable because the overall picture that appeared actually in the simulations at the time is that the system was very, very smooth over the length scales of the size of a nucleus. So you see here, uh, this is the energy density as a function of X and Y, this is in Fermi. Um, remember the radius of these nuclei is around five Fermi. Um, and if the system was really like this, with no structure, this is a very, very smooth thing, we can do our little business with the Knudsen number and check. So we can see how the energy varies in space. That will give us this capital L, the big scale. We can also check what happens, or we can try to assume what would be a decent choice for the microscopic scale. This will be in general something of the order one over the temperature. And if you put this together, we divide one by the other, we'll get a Knudsen number that will be of the order of 0.1 or even less. So the idea is that, you know, it should be, if the system is really near equilibrium, okay, so these gradients are small, and fluid dynamics should be applicable at scales of the size of a large nucleus. However, reality is much more complicated and much more interesting because, in fact, the QGP does not look like that at all. It looks like this. That's what the initial state looks like. There are large fluctuations um, there are fluctuations of the size of the order of the, uh, of the, of the nucleon or even less, or even you know, going to, to scales, length scales that are smaller than a proton itself. So there will be very large color fluctuations. But the point is that quantum mechanics cannot be avoided. There will always be unavoidable quantum fluctuations. And in fact, the geometry of these collisions is such that there should be very large spatial gradients at early times. So, at least in the initial state of heavy ions, the system is really not in equilibrium, close to equilibrium. And you can do simulations and check what this Knudsen number is like. Uh, and this is just one example that we did where you can see the Knudsen number is never really small um, in, in these systems. But this, this is interesting because it, it sort of creates like a, a paradox, right? Because I sort of started defining the stock with the idea that hydrodynamics should appear when this Knudsen number, uh, the ratio between the small, uh, the, the, the little microscopic scale and the scale within which the variables uh, uh, change, like the energy density or flow, I thought, I said that this uh, quantity should be smaller than one or be a, some, some small number. Um, but what we see here in practice is different. What we see is really a paradox in the sense that the Knudsen number is large it's never really small, but hydrodynamics 
this sort of collective behavior of the system, um, this seems to still work. This issue must be understood and the field is trying to understand that through different ways in theoretical ways and also experimentally. And experimentally, this is really interesting because um, what it was done um, for you know at least uh, uh, more than five years ago is to understand what happens to the system if you try to make it even worse in the case. Um, what I mean is that imagine the big scale, which was now the size of a nucleus, now make the nucleus smaller. So by, for example, considering not the collision of two gold nuclei, which are big, but the collision of a proton and a gold nucleus or a deuteron or even a helium gold or even a proton gold or, or for example, even proto-proton. So um, there were uh, simulations, there were predictions, there were experiments, and lo and behold, um, the general behavior of how the particles are emitted with the angle, you know, how these things are measured in the end, um, uh, to a good degree is described by these hydrodynamic models. So now we really have to understand this because um, even if you try to do this for proton proton, we would be saying that there, are there is this collective behavior that looks like fluid, that is fluid like at scales of the size of a proton itself, a very, very small thing. And the big question then is, how does this liquid behavior emerge from these fundamental interactions in QCD? We don't know the answer to that yet, but that's one of the big questions in this field. Now, what goes into these relativistic viscous hydro simulations done in heavy ion collisions? Um, here you see a simulation by Bjorn um, that compares an ideal fluid with a viscous fluid. So this, the viscosity is zero. And here there is some viscosity. And the thing that you can see here when it starts again is that as the ideal fluid evolves and the viscous fluid evolves, but um, you can see that the structure is much more preserved in the ideal fluid piece. So viscosity erases, starts to erase the initial structure that you see in your initial condition, which is an effect that you would expect. This is in the case in the relativistic system. Every single viscous relativistic hydrodynamic simulation in the context of heavy ions that you have ever seen in your life was based on ideas due to Israel and Stewart and other people um, also in the 60s. But Israel, Stewart, this is, uh, those are the ones that sort of defined what the equations of motions uh, that were used, for example, in that simulation done by Bjorn um, really were. And what is really this Israel Stewart theory? Well, this is Rose Stewart theory is certainly not a simple textbook hydrodynamics. And the idea is the following. Instead of just solving your um, standard variables, your standard hydrodynamic variables like the temperature or energy density and flow velocity, you treat that dissipative part, that part that creates entropy, you treat that also as a separate dynamical variable. So for example, here you would have your shear stress tensor and here it would be the bulk scalar. And what Israel Stewart theory really is, is a theory for these hydrodynamic fields and also these known hydrodynamic fields or, or variables that are not truly um, directly related to conservation laws. I mean, they are there in the team nu, which is in a sense conserved, but they don't follow conservation law. They're not uh, described by conservation law uh, themselves. In fact, what happens that the dynamics of the system of course has energy momentum conservation, but these variables, they are described by additional equations that look like these relaxation type of equations. They have here, for example, the bulk viscosity varying here and a bunch of other terms that I didn't write here. So there are many, many terms. There are many coefficients. And in the most general case that you can have here, if you also include a conserved current for the baryon number, uh, we have 14 equations of motion. One um, sort of phrase um, that sort of, um, is really pervasive throughout the field. Um, and we're now trying to understand if that's true or not, is uh, whether these Israel Stewart equations, the equations we actually used to do these simulations make sense, even this very far from equilibrium state that could happen in the, in, in the beginning of these heavy ion collisions. This is an implicit assumption made in current hydro simulations. And um, it's very important to understand how this question can be mapped here because what we're actually doing as we do the simulations and also the whole experimental program, both at RIC and LHC, the idea is that you decrease in the system size going from large nuclei, 
to smaller systems like PA and PP. So this is a figure by Shun Sheng, but it shows here what happens in AA. So that's this, the big system. And this, for example, it will be the PP system, something that is at least a factor of five smaller, okay? So of course, as you decrease the system size, you increase the theoretical uncertainty. We have to understand if what we are doing actually makes sense. So uh, important questions would be, when does this stop behaving hydrodynamically, right? So let's say that we all agree that this is hydrodynamics. So when does it stop? What, what, what is the number? Is there a threshold? Does it ever stop? Are there fundamental constraints that must be fulfilled for us to actually really know and say this system behaves hydrodynamically? What are these constraints? Um, one phrase that, uh, for example, I've heard many times, um, and, and actually just last month, is that these equations, these uh, this non-standard uh, textbook hydrodynamics using relativistic fluids called the usual steward theory, they were proven to be causal. By causality here, I mean causality in the sense of relativity, right? That no information can be propagated uh, faster than the speed of light. And uh, one um, common misconception is that these equations somehow work always. And there are never really any problems. For example, they are always causal under any circumstances. And this was done already in the 70s. This is simply not true. Like any good, decent theory of physics has limitations and Israel Stewart theory um, is, uh, is no different. We are now trying to understand what happens to, what are the limitations of this approach used throughout the whole field to simulate what the quark one plasma looks like. Um, in fact, what Israel Stewart did and other people afterwards that they proved that the system behaves causally. So um, causality, the sense of relativity was fulfilled if the transport coefficient satisfied a few conditions and that was done. And that's very important in the linearized regime around the equilibrium. So imagine the system is in equilibrium and just give it a little kick and see what happens in the linear regime. Of course, this says nothing nothing about the theory in the far from equilibrium regime probed in heavy ions, where even in the initial state, the, the ratio between the dissipative quantity, in this case, the shear stress tensor here, or the bulk scalar normalized, um, for example, by the pressure or the energy density, these quantities are large in the initial state of heavy ions. So this is known to occur in the initial state and also at the edges of the quark one plasma. So, we cannot just use what was done in the 70s. We need to produce something new. We need to understand what happens to the theory in the far from equilibrium regime, which actually means that we need to understand the full nonlinear behavior of this theory. This was done um, last year. So last year with my collaborators, we had in this paper here, we understood um, or we derived very general conditions for this system to behave causality is for causality to hold even in this non-linear far from equilibrium regime. So don't worry too much about the equation at this point. I'm happy to talk to you about all the details if you want after the talk. But basically the point is that if you use the equations, they're normally using heavy ion collisions. They include shear, bulk viscosity, a non-trivial equation of state. What we did, we derived the necessary conditions. We derived necessary conditions for this to be meaningful, for causality, for you know, the fact that nothing should propagate faster than the speed of light, um, we derive these constraints for this to make sense, right? Um, and this is really new because it really truly requires understanding the theory and the in, in the nonlinear regime. And then you could ask, what happens? Um, then you have high equilibrium. So now we understand that um, uh, in the far from equilibrium regime, you need this nonlinear interplay between the dissipative quantities like the shear stress, and et cetera, and also the transport coefficient. So there's a very complicated interplay between these quantities. So we could ask, what is going on then in heavy ion collision simulation? So for example, get the state of the art simulations, see what happens and check if causality, at least if causality is preserved. I mean, you would like that to be the case because you want to uh, really describe a relativistic fluid that behaves in accordance with relativity. Um, we did this, um, this is a study that we did um, that came out a month ago. This was also uh, investigated some other questions related to this by uh, Cheng and, and Shun Cheng, also around the same time. And this is the overall picture. So what happens is the following. 
Um, so we have here three simulations using three different uh, state-of-the-art codes that are used in all these quantitative extractions of the parameters of the QGP, for example, the shear viscosity, the bulk viscosity, et cetera. And this is the color coding that is very important. So red uh, denotes uh, cells or, or regions in the fluid where the system is acausal, so causality is violated. Uh, blue is the case is the case where causality for sure is satisfied, so the system for sure is fine. And purple is unknown, okay? So this is something that for those cells, we can tell they have, um, um, they, they have not violated causality from the necessary conditions that are red, but we cannot really say that um, uh, the other conditions were not uh, 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 violated. So basically uh, the purple says, we don't know what's going on. So if you see uh, in different simulations, particularly this one, we see that really in the initial state, the whole system is basically a causal. This a causality issue uh, continu continues for a few Fermi over C for, for a few time steps. Um, and only later, and for example, four or five Fermi over C, you start seeing that the system is, uh, the causality is such, that the system is such that causality is always uh, um, preserved. Um, you can do a more detailed study of this. You can see, in fact, for the initial state, uh, uh, for example, like 30% of the initial cells of the system are a causal in these state-of-the-art simulations. Of course, this is an issue, and this must be fixed. And this must be fixed. It uh, could be fixed by different ways. By, for example, uh, making sure that when you do these um, uh, simulations, you make sure that the parameters that you use, like the transport coefficients or the initial conditions, do not go into those bad regions, right? Um, and also another thing that could be done is to have a new uh, or better understanding what happens uh, at the initial state, like after the, after the, the, the nuclei collided. And um, there is another stage that we normally call pre-equilibrium. And um, this pre-equilibrium phase is there to tell you to go from the collision between the two nuclei to some point where hard dynamics start to really make sense. Uh, that's what happens, uh, for example, in these models, this one here called compost. And this, what we found, it does help to have this intermediate state where we have this pre-equilibrium evolution. It does help to remove some of these acausal behavior. It doesn't fix it completely, but it's certainly a step in the right direction. So I think a, a pretty good understanding of how this initial state the, after the collision of the two nuclei really behaves hydrodynamically later. Um, this is really fundamental to try to solve this type of problem that we uncovered recently. Okay, so let's now consider the other frontier. Um, now let's consider what happens to these, to relativistic fluids. They're, you know, defined at larger scales of the size of kilometers as in the case of neutron star mergers. So um, here, there are many uncertainties. So the first one, that very nice spot that I had for the pressure as a function of temperature, in this regime here, where you have many more baryons than antibaryons, the equation of state is not known. In fact, the properties of matter at extreme baryon densities remain unknown even in equilibrium. So this is a cartoon of what the phase diagram of QCD is. So that part, the one related to heavy ions that we just discussed, it's all here. Very, very, very small net baryon density, very large temperatures. And now as we go to neutron stars, you're going towards this direction smaller temperatures, but still non-zero, especially for mergers, and very large densities, okay? And this is unknown. Um, but recently, with the advent of uh, neutron star mergers, uh, new probes appeared to try to understand, for example, the equation of state of this matter, of the matter um, that appears in the collision of these two neutron stars. That's what this cartoon here is showing. There are many things that go into this. This is not the point of this talk, however. What I wanna tell you, um, or at least put this little seed uh, in your mind is to start thinking about this problem here, is that um, perhaps this neutron star merges that can tell us more than just what is the equation of state of the system. They could tell us um, also what happens when this ultra dense matter um, that you know, appears in the collision of these two neutron stars goes out of equilibrium. So the idea is that we should extract not just, or try to extract, not just the equation of state of the system, but also it's out of equilibrium properties, such as, for example, viscosity. So one of the important questions then is, how does a lump of baryon-rich QCD matter form these stars, uh, 
flow under very strong gravitational fields. So this is a, a little, uh, some snapshots of a simulation done by Rosales Group in Frankfurt. So here you see the two neutron stars coming before they collide. So this is in the spiral phase. At some point they collide. So that's what it looks like here. You see in this phase, the, the temperature gets elevated. Uh, there are gradients, large gradients, because you know the system is going through each other here. One, one star is going through the other here. Um, and then afterwards the system evolves. The important part here is to see the scale. This is the millisecond scale. That would be more or less the, the, the scale that you can see um, some signatures of this merger matter formed here um, in this post-merger phase, at least when it comes to the gravitational waves that are emitted around that time. So of course, there are many interesting questions here. So for example, there could be new signatures for deconfinement uh, or phase transitions in this ultra dense matter. Um, and I'll, but the question I'm interested in here is what happens when you have these viscous fluids or you know, what happens, how do you simulate this if the system itself has some viscosity created by some source in the presence of very strong gravitational fields? So um, this question has been studied over the years. There was some previous work by Dewis et al. in 2004, Shibata Kiyuchi in 2017, and, and, and other people actually recently. Um, one was study that was particularly interesting for me was this one done by Alfred and collaborators, where they tried to investigate first in the general, um, uh, some, in some general structure, what happens uh, with the different uh, viscous channels that could appear for this neutron star merger. So uh, basically what happens to the shear viscosity, to the thermal connectivity and the bulk viscosity. So for, for the shear dissipation, so shear viscosity is related to, for example, the amount of entropy that you generate in your system as you have adjacent layers on your fluid going uh, um, at different speeds with respect to the other, right? So this is this distorted thing here. This has to do with shear viscosity. And what they found is that this will be relevant if you have trapped neutrinos and sort of larger temperatures um, but also if you have very, very small structure, you have small structure at very small scales um, of the order 0 0.01 kilometers. Remember the radius of a neutron star is of the order like 10, 12 kilometers. Um, the other possible channel where a dissipation could appear is via thermal transport, right? So if you have a region that has a higher temperature and the lower temperature, there'll be a flux of heat going from the high temperature to the low temperature. What they found is that this was relevant for trapped electron neutrinos, if also for so, uh, largest, largest temperatures and uh, gradients that appear of the order 0.1 kilometers. So it's still much smaller than the radius of the star. However, bulk viscosity, at least in this study that they did and other studies done by Alfred and collaborators here, bulk viscosity could be very interesting. Um, and this leads to the idea of considering bulk viscous damping in neutron star mergers. So bulk viscosity here has to do with the resistance of the system to compression, compression and expansion, right? So this is uh, normally related to the bulk viscosity. This is what the symbol here means. And, and, and the point of this figure is to tell you that if you compare or if you try to compute the typical viscous damping time related to bulk viscosity, it could actually be of the order of the milliseconds needed to understand or to be seen in a gravitational wave that will be emitted by the system uh, at that point. Of course, there are many uncertainties and that's the point that we really try to, we have, really have to understand this. Um, um, for example, there are dependence on the equation of state. If, like, if you vary the equation of state, of course, uh, you vary the composition of the system, you vary the degrees of freedom. Then of course you vary what happens to this viscosity, this bulk viscosity. It also depends on what has happening with the neutrinos, if the matter is neutrino transparent or not. Also the type of frequencies related to this oscillation of this matter, right? So this matter after the, it's formed is differentially rotating and also kind of oscillating like this. And the effect of bulk viscosity will depend on what these oscillations are. However, in general, we know, I mean, at least the state of the art simulations tell us now that there are significant variations in the temperature the density and the fluid velocity in this post-merger phase. And um, I think uh, 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 the idea here is that these bulk viscosity effects, at least bulk viscosity first, should be investigated in simulations of neutron star mergers. Of course, there are other viscous contributions that deserve further investigation. As I said, thermal connectivity, shear viscosity, of course, also the effect of magnetic fields. Magnetic fields are important uh, in these systems, but at least bulk viscosity, I think it's, it's ripe 
to be studied um, right away. And then we have enough motivation to do so. But then you can ask, um, what will happen when you try to combine these relativistic fluids that were done in Havianas in flat space time? So this is Minkowski space time, no general relativity with general relativity. Now you try to put this fluid in a curved space time with viscosity, what happens? Is that a simple thing to do? It's just something that you can just open a book and say, oh, okay, it's here. I can just code these equations, done. Well, no. Um, when it comes to viscous fluid in general relativity, this has a huge uh, history in this field. And in general, one may say that there is a technical roadblock of this magnitude um, that actually prevented simulations like the ones that I, I was arguing about here, the ones, um, for example, including bulk viscosity or shear viscosity, it has prevented those simulations for many years. So, but why is this so challenging, right? Um, people know how to solve differential equations. So what's going on here? Well, now you have to solve the viscous fluid equations coupled with general relativity, right? So space-time will react to the type of fluid that you put in there. And of course, uh, the fluid will move according, you know, uh, solving the equation of motion of the fluid and also Einstein's equation. So this coupled system of Einstein plus fluid equations is highly nonlinear. So nonlinear equations are hard to understand. Um, you have to really understand its properties in the full nonlinear regime, what happens to causality, if the system makes sense, you know, even, math even mathematically. And previous approaches to viscous fluids are either acausal or unstable or not known to have a well de well-defined initial value problem relativity. By that, by that, I mean that um, for most approaches, we don't know if you set up a well-defined initial condition for your metric to solve Einstein's equation and for the fluid to solve the high dynamic equations, when you put them together, it was not, uh, for some uh, approaches, it's not really known if this thing makes sense, if the system will continue evolving in a nice way after it's defined in the initial state. The situation changed, I would say dramatically, in the last couple of years, and, and, and as I will show you now. So um, the approach that I'm gonna focus here has to do with this generalized first order theories of relative viscous, viscous fluids. And I'll explain to you what, it, what I mean by that uh, in the following slides. So now the idea is the following, okay? So we are not talking about heavy ion collisions anymore. We are talking about these neutron stars, right? That as it's currently done, the simulation of neutron star merge, this is done for fluids in equilibrium, okay? So you solve the equations of ideal fluid dynamics coupled to gravity. Those are very complicated things. Uh, you can also put uh, uh, electromagnetic fields as well, or for example, solve magneto uh, hydrodynamics. Um, so my first step here is to understand the very first effects of viscosity. So what happens when you try to put the system a little bit out of equilibrium by putting viscosity and then still solving with Einstein's equations, the fluid dynamics and et cetera. That's the idea of the near equilibrium behavior. So I, I assume that the system is not just in local equilibrium, but it has some little viscous effects. And that is currently understood is in generally, generally is understood for I guess hundred years in terms of this thing called the derivative or the gradient expansion as I'm gonna review now. Um, let me first tell you what is the idea, the main ideas of this generalized uh, first order relativistic hydro uh, approach. So this was originally proposed by uh, my collaborators and, and myself here in 2018. This was followed by Cofton. And also we did some other work um, and Cofton and his student uh, Holt and also us again here in 2000, uh, I mean, last year, 2020. And this basically gives you the whole structure. So the first papers about the conformal regime, then the second series of papers about the non-conformal regime where the pressure is not just given by epsilon divided by three. And then all the complications and many complications that appear once you include a, a finite density or a known zero current for the barrier number uh, were figured out last year. And the idea is the following. So imagine that you have a system really in equilibrium, for example, like this little cup of coffee here. So of course, um, quantities like the energy momentum tensor and the bearing current, which is this new element here, um, they come from you know, expectation values of your quantum field theory. They're well-defined quantities in equilibrium and also out of equilibrium, right? There's nothing uh, complicated. You can do these expectation values if you were able to find what is, for example, the density matrix of your system in an out of equilibrium state, you can take a trace and you're done and you compute these quantities. 
But in equilibrium, things are much easier to understand because we know that we can describe, we know we can describe these quantities here in terms of temperature, chemical potential associated, for example, with the baryon density and the flow velocity, right? So this is the ideal regime of the regime in equilibrium. And there is a well-defined mapping between the temperature, chemical potential, and flow velocity, and these uh, original variables. However, what happens out of equilibrium? Out of equilibrium, of course, the expectation value of the operator is fine. It's completely well-defined. So T mu nu and J mu is completely well-defined. However, how do you map those quantities um, into these original hydrodynamic variables like temperature, chemical potential, and flow velocity in a situation that is out of equilibrium. And now you have you know, more gradients that take the system away from equilibrium um, and get complicated, as you can see, for example, in this neutron star merger simulation done by Vincent et al. last year. What happens, and this is known for the field for decades, is that, of course, you can map T mu nu and J mu into these hydrodynamic variables in many different ways. Each one of these definitions, how you define temperature, chemical potential, and flow velocity in an out of equilibrium situation, this is called a hydrodynamic frame. Here, the word frame is very unfortunate, <laughs> has nothing to do with a real Lorentz frame or Lorentz boost. This is just a name. So this just means the definition of these variables in, um, in the order of equilibrium system. And of course, Eckert had its own frame. Linda Lifshitz had its own frame. Israel, the same user from Israel suit, had its own frame back in the day, 1970s, in the 1970s. So it's known that you can always, always consider different definitions for these variables. Um, but now the point is that you have to be systematic. And that's, I think, the, one of the main contributions of this generalized first order approach that we propose is that once you are really out of equilibrium, what do you do? You, as in any, um, general approach, you get the variables that you want and you write the most general form for it. So for the energy momentum tensor, if you try to describe it in terms of a, a, a time-like vector, like here, the flow velocity, <clears throat> there are many different channels that appear. There is something that goes with the flow velocity, something that is orthogonal to the flow velocity, something that is orthogonal to the flow velocity, but it has no trace, and a vector. This is energy uh, flux here. Um, also appears in this composition. This is the most general decomposition that you can have for a system out of equilibrium. In equilibrium, you only have these two. Out of equilibrium, you must have this guy, this one, and of course, this one to be symmetric. Um, you can do the same for the bearing current. There is something that goes in the direction of the flow and something that goes orthogonal to the flow. That's the most general thing that you can do with a vector. Of course, what you see is that once you include dissipation, there are more terms. There are these new terms that appear. And also you have to start thinking about what is the definition, what is the meaning of those variables that come here uh, in this so-called ideal fluid part? I mean, is the energy density that you see really the equilibrium energy density? Does it have to be? So how does one fix such terms? Further assumptions, of course, uh, of course are needed. And the standard approach is to use the derivative expansion. The derivative expansion is just to say that in equilibrium, all of these things, for example, if you're thinking in, in flat space time, all the fields are constant and uniform. And as you get out of equilibrium, they should, uh, corrections out of equilibrium should come with derivatives. So all of these quantities here, this J, this Q, this pi, they will be proportional to derivatives of the high dynamic fields. That's the idea of the derivative expansion. But of course you have to do that systematically. Um, of course, you also wanna make sure that this is compatible with the second law of thermodynamics and also that you should recover normal relativistic physics when the velocities involved are small. And what we did here um, was really to use, you know, an approach from effective field theory, right? So what do you do? You write the most general expansion, expansion uh, in this case, at first order in derivatives. So you see, I'm really just thinking about the system near equilibrium, so I don't need to go to higher and higher order derivatives. So you write the most general thing that is compatible with the symmetries. Um, and that actually defines the system, the most general possible hydrodynamic frame or the most general definition for the temperature, chemical potential, and flow velocity in your system. And that, when you do that, you actually see that all these expressions that I saw here, in the T mu nu and the J, they come with derivatives, first order derivatives of the variables. For example, here, the temperature, flow, chemical potential, all of these contributions, they have to be in principle considered and taken into account. So um, this theory will certainly have the usual transport coefficients like shear viscosity, 
bulk viscosity and, and for example, heat, heat conductivity. But they also have these new coefficients here, these new things that what they're basically doing, they're telling you, they're parametrizing the freedom that you have, that you always had when choosing the hydrodynamic fields in this out of equilibrium scenario. But of course you can ask, what choices are physical, right? So you open up this huge Pandora box and you know this in principle was already known in the field, but what do you do? I mean, are there frames that are better than others? Are there definitions that are better than others? What do you do? How do you find what's physical? Well, one thing that you can understand um, and you can derive that in the regime of validity of this theory, right? So we are truncated to first order. So in the regime of validity of the first order theory, any choice of the hydrodynamic frame actually satisfies the second law of thermodynamics if the usual transport coefficients, shear, bulk, and the heat conductivity are positive, which is something that you normally do anyways. So you can write an entropy current and you can show that in the regime of validity of the theory, this, the entropy current is, uh, has positive divergence or, or no negative divergence as you would expect from the second law. And another thing that you can see is that all of these new parameters, all of these new parameters can be constrained by imposing that the system is causal and stable. So causality in the sense that I said before in relativity and stable in the sense that if you have the system in equilibrium and you give it a kick, you don't want this to explode. You want you know, the disturbances to go back to equilibrium as a normal flu fluid normally does. And the proof for all of these conditions can be found in these original papers here. And the point of this is that this leads to a set of good definitions that will give you guidance to understand what is temperature, chemical potential, and flow velocity as you get out of equilibrium. So how can these new developments be used to understand this hot and possibly viscous ultra dense matter in neutron star mergers? Um, using this formalism um, in this last paper that we had uh, last year, um, we wrote down something that we think could be useful for simulations, um, especially in neutron star mergers. So we have a baryon current, which we choose to write in the standard uh, uh, way that looks like an ideal fluid, but of course it's not because there are corrections. Um, so this, for, for those that know uh, the details, this will be like a current a la Eckert. While the energy momentum tensor, of course, has to have many contributions. It has a contribution to the energy density. There is an out of equilibrium contribution to the energy density. There is an out of equilibrium contribution to the pressure, and there is the shear viscosity and also this heat flux. Um, we, among all the possible uh, choices, we figured out a nice uh, a set of equations where the contribution to the energy density is given this way. So this again, first order in derivatives. The contribution to the pressure, of course, you have a bulk viscosity and some other term. And for the energy flux, you could also have derivatives of the, the flow velocity, energy density, and for example, the particle number or the baryon number. This theory introduces uh, three quantities here that could that have the dimensions of relaxation times. And what they do for those for the for the specialists, they parameterize the non-hydrodynamic sector in your theory. So we want this theory to be causal. We want this essential property of relativity to be satisfied for this system of equations. And the equations of motion are just, you know, get that T mu nu get the J mu, take a derivative equal to zero. Those are the equations of motion. There's nothing else, no additional equations of motion are, uh, are needed. One can prove that this system given by the fluid plus the Einstein's equations is causal if the following conditions are satisfied. Okay, so that's a, a proof in this theorem that we have last year. The, the thing is actually complicated to do. It requires computing the characteristics in the full nonlinear regime. Um, but we developed many techniques over the years to understand and compute this and determine causality in this theory. So if these conditions are satisfied, you're good. Now, another uh, part that is important that we normally take for granted in physical theories is the idea of well posedness, uh, actually more specifically local well posedness. And this is important for us here because um, we are solving PDEs, right? So if you wanna do simulations, you're solving PDEs. Uh, and the idea is that a system of partial differential equations is locally well posed. If given the initial data, so you give the initial condition, you can prove that a local solution exists. By local solution, I mean that you can prove that for some finite time, at least for some finite time, the solution exists and the solution is unique, okay? Also, uh, one thing that is uh, sometimes is not considered in, into the local well posedness concept, but I like to put it here is that you want the solution to depend continuously on the initial data because 
That's what we want to do in the simulation, right? You can vary the initial data here and want to see how the simulation varies as well. One interesting property about these equations, these new equations, that once you consider the fluid plus Einstein's equations, you can prove that the system is not only causal, but also strongly hyperbolic, and the initial value problem is well posed. Um, for the most, uh, of, for those that work in this field, what we can prove is that the system is strongly hyperbolic. Uh, this is done by writing the equations in a nonlinear first order form, and then we prove that all eigenvalues are real, and the set of eigenvectors form a complete set. This is for the full system. There's no approximation here. So the full system is a nonlinear system. Another property that is very useful, of course, is that we, we uh, also able to prove that uh, equilibrium states are stable, right? So if you kick the system when it was in equilibrium, the, the system will go back to equilibrium. This is also, that's the context of the third theorem proved uh, in this work. So to finalize here, um, based on our experience with heavy ion collisions, just thinking about heavy ion collisions in the last 20 years, what we did, we had a transition from ideal fluids, when the people were doing simulations of heavy ions using ideal fluids, no viscosity, of course, in flat space time, and going from that to viscous fluids. In this transition, this transition really made the field much richer and led to a paradigm shift in many new insights. So for example, the idea of nearly perfect fluidity of the coagulant plasma, the uh, much better characterization of the initial state, for example, whether or not there is gluon saturation and what are its consequences? How can you dis disentangle that, this initial state effect from final state effects, in this case, related to hydrodynamics? Also, the whole idea of the emergence of hydrodynamics far from equilibrium would not have been possible if we had not made this transition to consider what viscous fluids are like in relativity, which uh, had to appear here in heavy ions. And also, of course, there are many connections to other fields. For example, in string theory within the context of ADSFT, with the famous and celebrated eight over S being one of four pi, uh, also for the field of code atoms, applied mathematics. So there are many things that appear when they made this transition. I hope that the inclusion of viscous effects in neutron star mergers will lead to new discoveries and will force us to go back to the drawing board and try to simulate this system, understanding what happens, uh, for example, after the system is formed, the neutron stars collide in this super big, hypermassive remnant, very complicated, differentially rotating. How does that work? So these are questions that can be addressed. Uh, and I hope this will lead to new opportunities and new discoveries in this field. So for conclusions, um, I argued here that this quark gluon plasma formed in heavy ion collisions really forces us to explore what happens to relativistic, relativistic fluids far from equilibrium. And one thing that we are learning recently is that despite uh, many indications that the system behaves in some collective manner, there are constraints that could be really challenging when we try to understand what happens to these fluids when they are far from equilibrium. For example, we saw the violation of causality. And uh, going now to the large scale in the case of neutron star mergers, I think they really raise the possibility to determine not only the equilibrium, like properties of the equation of state, but also out of equilibrium properties, like viscous properties of hot ultra dense matter. And uh, finally, I showed also here a new first order formulation that I hope will pave the way for describing for the first time all of these viscous fluid effects in general activity simulations, in this case of neutron star mergers. That's it. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for a nice presentation. Now let's go to questions. If anybody has a question, please raise your hand. There are claps in the audience. Indeed, that was a very nice presentation. So any questions? Well, can you question here? Okay. The heavy, heavy, I can follow it, right? Heavy, heavy. So sometimes I'm protons heavy. Doesn't work. Sorry, I'm not sure if I understood. So, um, a yeah, collision you protons? talk connections, heavy, heavy, right? Or what, or here. Yeah? But one picture showed only, oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, protons connections with heavy ones here. Doesn't work also? Yeah, so, um, yeah, so, so if I understand your question, you're asking what happens when you have a proton which is small with a big nucleus? Yes, so in that case, these experiments were done. So normally, uh, it goes in the, by the name of PA or proton nucleus collisions. And in those systems, as I said, uh, even though they're smaller, normally smaller than the big lead nuclei, for example, when they collide, uh, 
Uh, in those systems, you do see these uh, typical hydrodynamic signatures. Yes, you do see it. There are details, uh, very interesting details when it comes to the experiment and how these things fluctuate. For example, how the distribution of particles with respect to angle, how they fluctuate if you measure two particles or four particles, six particles uh, in your experiment. But in general, the idea is that this sort of collective behavior that we saw before in large systems seem to appear, at least experimentally, in other systems, for example, like in proton nucleus. Yes. Thank you. This excellent colloquial. Thank you. Thank you. I agree. Next question, Mubarak al Qatani. Hi, Mubarak. How's it going? Good. So uh, uh, thanks for this great uh, talk, George. I have two naive questions. If you can go, uh, please, back to the uh, red, purple, uh, blue graphs. Oh, OK, OK, the causality ones, yes. Yes, the causality ones. So maybe two naive questions, but. Uh, so the first one, is, is it clear uh, for you the mechanism of, of these cells going from a, a, a causal to, to, uh, to causal ones? No, yeah. Um, so you see- The mechanism the itself, because after, after some time they go from red to blue, is the mechanism you know, uh, understood here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just because the system is expanding and, and um, just think about, uh, it's not exactly Bjorken as you know, but if you were to think about it like a Bjorken expansion, you mm -hmm. know, have one over tau and tau gets large, so the gradient starts to get smaller. So that's what happens. Okay, so that's because... more or less what happens, yes. Mm -hmm. So eventually it will all be blue, unless there is something really weird going on. But the point is that it takes a little while. And of course, it depends on the initial conditions, how much structure you had. Of course, it depends on the transport coefficient. So this, we didn't change any transport coefficient. We just got mm -hmm. straight out of the box for these fantastic codes that people have online for heavy ions. And we just close our eyes and ran it. Okay. Um, that's what we get. Of course, if you change the transport coefficients, then you know there are going to be some different structure. But the general behavior is that you do see large uh, causality violations in the initial state. Okay, that's clear. Now, how fast it, it goes to blue, for example? Does that help? How, how fast, or, or is that something we can get some information of uh, of the problem itself, of the issue? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think now we are in the uh, in the phase of understanding the consequences and and, and seeing um, and how this can be fixed, right? So one thing, for example, that you see is that imagine that you were to start with that little bump, the the you know since you're a specialist, the Glauber one, like the uh, okay. average Glauber one, the which there's no structure. There's just a little bump like this. If okay. we start with that guy um, at uh, at decent time, for example, one or two Fermis, then the system will be basically blue. It will just evolve and it'll be all blue. However, if you start with that guy without any structure at 0 0.3 Fermi over C or 0 0.6 Fermi over C that we normally do, right? We start these things pretty early. Then of course the gradients are large. And even though you start all blue, boom, you get out a causal uh, regions again. Okay. So I, I think the point is that um, we need something that goes in between the real initial state. For example, in this year, this is really like, um, so this is an IP plus, plus music simulation. So you have the IP initial state, then you have a classical Yang Mill simulation, then you need something in between. That's what this figure is telling you. You need something in between to evolve the system until, I don't know, too Fermi. And then from there on, then you can do the test, see the hydrodynamics fine, then you go ahead. I guess that's the overall picture. Okay, good. So the second question, if I have time, uh, you know, uh, about the benefit of this. So we can fix the issue, I think, you know, in one way or the other, you may fix the issue, but does the, the final observables somehow, some of them are sensitive uh, to, to the, uh, the acausality of, of the initial state? Because the yeah. final state observables may not be sensitive to, uh, to this at all. So yeah. what so is the this... benefit in this case? Yeah, so this is this is an important question that you have to that I don't think we can answer yet. Um, mm -hmm. So there are two things two things that I can say. So first, uh, actually, in the paper by 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 Shunshane and his student, they actually looked uh, what happens to V two and V three and things like that. And one thing that happens the following, of course, uh, actually in this slide, you see that the um, the number of a causal cells is very large in the beginning. So this is uh, the time of the evolution divided by the maximum time, okay? Mm 
And of course, as the time goes by, most of the system becomes causal again, as you would expect. And um, if you actually see, even though you have large violations of causality in the beginning, if you count all the possible cells that you had in the system, and you count all the cells that were a causal, the number is not going to be larger than 5%. Okay? So then you could say, oh, but then it doesn't matter because V2 never sees anything. Okay, I think we have to be better than that as a field. Okay, because sure, sure. what happens, what happens here is that in the part where V2 is being created, right, where there are, lar there are large gradients, gradients, we are using the theory that we are supposed to solve a relativistic theory in a regime that is clearly unphysical, or at least it has unphysical uh, um, conditions. So what I think has to be done here, and this was not done. So for example, when Shun did this calculation, or when we did here, we actually didn't look so much at that yet. What I think it's important, it would be the following. Imagine that, for example, when you do the, the big Bayesian analyses in heavy ions, right? Those fantastic beasts that give you everything about the system, eight over S, bulk of viscosity, whatever. What you have to do, I think one can just do, I hope this is feasible. You can put a penalty if the system tries to go through regions where um, you know those causality constraints, which can be done. I mean, you can just put that in a code. Um, you can put constraints or penalties for the system to try to probe those regions. And that will affect what the transport coefficients look like, right? So I think this can be fixed. Um, so there is this sort of the practical way by sort of implementing that in the Bayesian analyses. And also I think the thing that is more interesting for me is the real true physics that happens in this initial state to this in this pre-equilibrium phase, right? So really how the system becomes hydrodynamic, how the system, how hard dynamics emerges in the system. That's, I think, um, what this issue is showing is that we have to pay attention to that phase and not just plugging one thing to the other. There's a lot of physics that has to be considered in there. Okay, I agree and thanks for the detailed answer. Thank you. Okay, next question is from Boris Tomasek. Hi, Boris. Yes, hello. Hey, George. So I, I'm trying to understand this from perspective. Uh, when I look at this picture right here, you have a causal regions. Then later on, you were talking about this um, neutron star mergers, and you, I think you said you proved that those equations are causal. Now that's that's hydrodynamics plus gravity. So naively, I would think if you leave out gravity, you have hydro, which we apply here. So, so what's the difference? Because because there okay. later on on a more complicated system, you, you you have proven that it's causal. Here we have a causal region. So is it the state is not suitable to be described, or is there a difference in the equation? No, yeah, yeah, of course there there are many many differences. So the first thing for this whole set here. These are done with these Israel Stewart equations. This was not the same thing that I talked about in neutron star mergers. And the neutron star merger was this new first order, like the fix of Navier Stokes theory, making Navier Stokes okay. Okay, that's what the second part was. This is in the first part of the talk that we actually use the standard Israel Stewart equations that are used in heavy ion collisions. And what we did in here, and you know, I, I was not able to explain this in detail, what these constraints are, they are the following they tell you what is that you have to do for the system to be causal. It doesn't say that the system is always causal, right? So for example, if you remember in the linear regime, remember that there was a condition with eta and the tau pi, that eta divided by tau pi cannot be infinity. I mean, it has some sort of number. That is a well-known thing that it comes back from, you know, goes back to Hickscock, Limblom, and this was arrived in the eighties. It's a condition for the system to make sense in the linear regime. What we did, we went to the nonlinear regime. And now, I don't know if you can see it, but it actually connects the viscosity yeah. to the values of the field itself. That's why it's a nonlinear case. And what this tells you is that these are constraints. If the system is satisfied, you're good. What we found and, um, is that uh, in the initial state of heavy ions, all of these large deviations from equilibrium actually probe a causal regions. If you do hydrodynamics, of course, QCD knows better. QCD is not a causal, right? QCD, you know, when the divine solves the equations and heavy ion collisions, it works. There's no violation of causality or anything. The point is that we are trying to use this specific theory of relativistic hydrodynamics that has limitations. And we are now probing its limitations there in the initial state. I hope this is, this is clear. Yeah, yeah, thank you. 
Okay. Okay, next question is Chingyang Wang. Yeah, okay. Oh, hi, George. Uh, this is, is a, you can consider this a question or comment. So you have pointed out um, many scenarios uh, that break down essentially of second order hydrodynamics, right? The weather is, uh, um, the growth number become too, too big. So you, you really uh, all, uh, it become a, couch, a causal. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, we also don't know whether there is, I mean, you can, you can try to bridge this problem by solve the problem by some other kind of theory, for example, transport. But transport has its own problem. So yeah. do you think there is essentially, we, have, we don't really know a perfect theory to solve you know, this problem yet. And then, and then before we have that, what is, can anybody give a rough estimate? What is the bulk uncertainty people trying to extract, for example, shear viscosity to entropy ratio? I mean, you yourself have quoted a certain number, right? Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's an excellent comment. Um, I agree, I think, and, I, and, and again, as I said, my hope is that these type of studies will lead more and more people to think about this complicated phase that goes from the initial state to the hydro phase. Um, transport also has its issues in the sense that, um, you know, if, if the coupling is not really small in that pre-equilibrium phase, um, then yeah, there's yeah. really reason to believe that that should be a good approach. Um, and of course, uh, you can go to the strong coupling regime, you know, a regime that I like very much, but of course, the theory there is interesting. You can solve many things. You can do an infinite coupling. But again, we know that the system there is not infinitely coupled in, re in reality. And these theories are not really QCD. They are very good models, but not QCD. So I agree that we don't have an answer to that yet. But that's why the issue has to be pointed out. So then more and more people have to think about it. Um, when it comes to precise numbers, I think the most direct way would be for those people that are involved in these Bayesian calculations, basically to take into account these constraints and make sure that um, you know, the simulation that you have in the end is free from all of these issues. It, it, it is possible, it should be possible to do that. And then we see how that affected the actual extraction of eight over S, Z over S and et cetera. I think this is, this is really a uh, um, thing that can be done. And at least it's, it's in a sense, it's the first thing we can do. The real big deal is to figure out the pre-equilibrium, but uh, I guess we'll get there as a field. Yeah, I, I mean, most of the Bayesian analysis is based on right now the model, this kind of uh, second order risk exactly. hydrodynamics model. Exactly. And uh, so I, I guess at least before we know the right answer, we have to bear in mind that uh, there are uncertainties exactly. that has not been explored by this Bayesian analysis. Yeah, I think this is just a new uh, class of uncertainties. More than just, uh, you know, what is the bulk? What is the form of the bulk viscosity? What is the temperature dependence of eta? This is a structural issue. That we, there are regimes where the equations themselves are not really uh, doing what you want to. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's move to the next question by Misha Stefano. Hi, Misha. How are you doing? Hi, George. Uh, thanks uh, for an interesting talk. Um, in the spirit of uh, uh, the question from uh, Xinyan, um, so when we look at, or when you looked at, uh, uh, at this red, purple, blue slides at the um, um, Israel Stewart, uh, we know that um, uh, the theory has its um, boundaries of applicability somewhere hydrodynamics will yeah. not be able to describe, uh, for example, very early, we cannot uh, expect hydrodynamics to apply, uh, whether it's Israel Stewart, whether it's new formalism exactly. that we're proposing. So with the Israel Stewart, there was a kind of red flag, uh, which it would rise uh, when it doesn't apply. We could, for example, check whether it violates um, causality and therefore uh, this is where Typically, as I understand, uh, in practice, what one does is vary the second order hydrodynamic coefficients uh, parameters in like relaxation time 
and uh, see if the results you're looking at uh, are weakly or strongly dependent on, on those parameters, which uh, should be considered in some sense as unphysical. And so you trust the results if they are not. So my mm -hmm. question is, um, how would you determine uh, when uh, the, um, uh, this uh, improved theory that you propose, uh, the always causal theory which you propose, um, uh, cannot be trusted when you uh, overstep the boundary of its applicability? Oh, okay, okay, very good question. Um, so, no, for, when it comes from this here, I mean, let, let me just stress this theory. It's causal. So what we have in the theorems, you know, causal, well, pose all these, these complicated things if certain conditions are met, okay? So for example, as you see here, this parameter has to be larger than this parameter. This has to be larger than that. Uh, we, of course, check that this is not empty, like the, the set of conditions are not empty, so we can actually uh, satisfy that. So there are, of course, restrictions. So just like it happened in Israel Stewart, okay? So this, in, in principle, this always has to be the case. Um, I so, think but the that's second, yeah. not quite what I wanted to ask. No, no, yeah, I understand. The second part is the following. The second part is the following. There are very obvious things that appear here that one can check. So for example, um, you see, this guy here is the out of equilibrium correction to the energy density. If you are in a situation where this is comparable to this, for sure, you're completely out of the regime of the theory, completely out of the regime of applicability of the theory, as it should be, right? So. Here, I think actually you can see, just compute the gradient, right? The, this expression here, compared to this, see what the difference is, just like uh, what you would do if you could solve Navier Stokes. And you see, if the first order correction is, you know, if the ratio of A to epsilon is of order one, you are really applying the theory in a, in a bad regime. And there's a, actually, there are other things as well. So, for example, if that ever happens, you can find uh, violations of positivity conditions, energy positivity conditions uh, in this system, as we explain in the papers. So it's, it's not, there is certainly far from being free lunch. <laughs> uh, there are very strong limitations. In fact, this theory is very limited. It's just really for first order deviations, right? One has to go to second order if you want. Um, this has not been done yet. But it, it certainly has limitations. And it, I think it's, you can actually compare if, the, um, if you are in the regime of applicability or not, as it, this has been done in simulations, actually. If I go here to my additional slides, there was a very nice uh, recent paper here by Alex Pandya and Franz Pretorius in Princeton, where um, this came out I mean, two weeks ago, where they actually solve uh, these equations and compare to Israel Stewart. Um, and they see what happens to shock waves or when, you know, uh, and actually they see that there are uh, cases where that out of equilibrium corrections, they get very large. So then of course you are in the regime uh, that is outside the validity of the theory. What they actually were able to see and it's very nice is that in the regime where the Israel Stewart theory seems to be applicable and this first order theory seems to be applicable, the results are more or less similar. And of course, if you keep pushing it, then they're gonna behave differently. Um, this uh, and this this can be done in detail or at least seen in detail in their paper that came out here. So um, I think we're still trying to understand this in practice. And it'll be very nice to see that in a real, real or heavy ion simulation where I can make those red, blue, purple plots for the new theory as well. Yeah, I, I, I was thinking that this could uh, help answer Xinyang's uh, question too. Yeah, uh, this yes, is, yes. Uh, 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 one just just think about criteria which determine when uh, this uh, theory is applicable, and uh, um, we have to deal with the situation that some earlier regimes exactly. may not be susceptible to any kind of uh, improvement of hydrodynamics. It's just it could, yeah, yeah, pure it's, thermal field theory. I'll yeah, so I, I think that's what this thing is telling you is that um, if we are pushing this too far, we have to see its consequences. And um, we have to make sense of the results. So I think we are in that phase. Um, yes. Okay. Thanks. Next question is from Henry De Jong. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for a good talk. Uh, my question may be naive, but um, what effect on your uh, modeling does it uh, does the choice of the metric have, and also metric uh, changes perhaps with the energy density fluctuations in these situations? <laughs> 
Um, in what context did you mean? You mean in this uh, in the neutron star merger context? Uh, in particular, that yeah. Yeah. Um, no. Yeah. So what we did we do here? Um, we consider the theory fully coupled to general relativity, right? So we have. So when, we, when the statements that I'm making are the statements uh, related to the Einstein's equations fully coupled to the conservation laws like d mu t mu equals zero, right? Which yeah. actually follows from Einstein. Um, and uh, what we have, I mean, I don't have any simulation uh, of this new theory in gravity, like put a gravitational system or like a neutron star merger and then see what happens. This was not done yet, but this it's in the works. Uh, but the statements that I can make here when I talk about causality, or well posedness, uh, uh, as you can see here, those are for the fully coupled system uh, of equations. So um, the metric, of course, can be very general as it, it's a solution of Einstein's equations. You have to set up the initial value problem for Einstein's mm -hmm. equations. Of course, you know you have to make sure that um, you know uh, apart from the the standard diffeomorphism part. So you set up initial data. So that's that's what this technical thing is saying here. So you set up the initial data for the for the metric and the initial data for the fluid part. And then what the theorem tells you is that there is a local solution that has, has all these cool properties and blah, blah, blah. OK. So it's pretty general. Yeah, it's, in a, it's still in the early stages. Uh, for simulations, of course. Yeah, as I saw, uh, for simulations, for example, the, this thing here that Franz did with a student was the very first simulation that was not really uh, fully done with symmetries. For example, we did Bjork and flow, which is a fully symmetric thing that we can do almost analytically and also Gubser flow, but they did a simulation one plus one in flat space time. So now the point is to go beyond one plus one in flat yeah. space time and then couple to gravity and do things. Okay, interesting, thank you. Okay, now we have two more questions written in the messages. So the first question is from Andres Stecklein. He says, Dear Dr. Noronha, thank you very much for your talk. Can such signatures from neutron star mergers be observed in neutrino experiments? In neutrino experiments? Um, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I mean, the, the bulk viscosity that we have they, of course, it comes from this chemical imbalance that appears when the system oscillates. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure. I, I don't see an immediate connection. But also, I'm not a big specialist on neutrinos, so I don't know. Yeah, uh, he couldn't speak uh, because of the microphone, so I had to read. Sure. But my understanding might be you mentioned about the neutrinos being coupled, decoupled, and of course, that's oh, yeah, the of course. electroweak that, that, scale and bulk viscosity. Exactly. So that seems to be kind of related. Yeah, yeah, that, that's the part that is certainly related. Um, what it's um, from neutrino experiments, I don't know. Um, like, what do you mean with just uh, normal uh, particle physics experiments trying to see neutrino oscillations? Um, I don't see an immediate connection, um, but I don't know. I mean, so this is, uh, these are just extra slides, but we actually show um, with, with estimates in neutron star merger simulations that the viscosity effect could be up to 10%. Um, in the local evolution of the system here. This is gonna come out in a paper, hopefully in two weeks. We are writing this as fast as we can. <laughs> as always. As okay, always. There, is, there is another question. Actually, there are two more questions from Igor Moore. Uh, regarding causality, couldn't one employ choquette bruchard theorems for coupled Einstein equations sourced either by generalized Navier-Stokes or for viscous fluids, uh, the Liray or here hyperbolic system? I'm not sure yes, if I can answer that correctly. That's, exactly, that's what we did. We actually used, I mean, choquette bruchard is one of the great books for this. Um, so what do you do? So we actually, what do we actually do? What to prove causality here. So the first thing is this was not done before. Okay, so you cannot find it in the book. But of course, the book tells you what is what it means to, for a system to be hyperbolic. Um, you have the definition of what is a system when the system is strongly hyperbolic in the presence of gravity. So Shokerbu have proved um, that you know everything will be fine for pure Einstein, right? And Einstein with standard types of matter. But the point is that, that you have to remember is the following: when you put a T mu nu in Einstein's equations, as I can show here, is Einstein's equations. So yeah, so when I do Einstein's equations here, uh, it makes a difference if this T mu nu itself has derivatives, okay? And in the case of a viscous fluid, it does have derivatives and you have to check, right? To see how, you know, this whole system of equations work, if it's a strongly hyperbolic system or not. And that's what we did. 
we use the standard uh, uh, advanced, I guess, uh, PDE, PDE tools to prove hyperbolicity for this system, this fully coupled system of equations. Okay. So there is a follow-up question from, again, from Igor Mool that is related to the previous question by uh, Henry de Jong. Rigorous definitions for energy momentum, such as bondi sachs uh, works only for asymptotically flat space times. Is the initial data for Cauchy problem mm -hmm. for your problem able to define precisely a bondi aspect? Um, we didn't. We didn't check this. Um, that's uh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I'll have to think about this. So. So the space time, as we as we prove that it, it you know it comes out, is a globally hyperbolic space time. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I have to think about it. I have to get back to you. Okay. Uh, I don't see any other questions from the audience. I did have uh, one of the questions of my own regarding the effects of the bulk viscosity in mergers. We do know that uh, it's actually tricky to extract actual observables, even if bulk viscosity is relevant in some sense for the dynamics. Uh, are there any specific observables that might be promising that you could use to uh, estimate the bulk viscosity or see its signature? Yeah, I mean, uh, so what, the first thing that we imagine as, as we see here um, in this simulation is that if you include the bulk viscosity, um, we should see uh, a very different type of evolution, right? So this, the, the way the system, how energy momentum is distributed is different. And the hope is that this actually affects the gravitational waves that are emitted. Um, so this was investigated for the case of shear by Shibata and collaborators here. Um, and this is an early study where they showed that, you know, so this, the, the, the red one is the gravitational wave without the viscosity. And then the blue and the, the green is like, if you put some viscosity. So, it's expected that it could affect the gravitational wave form measured. And of course- So yeah. that seems pretty dramatic actually. Oh no, yeah, but, but, but they, they exaggerated. They put too much. <laughs> I they, see, they, I see. They didn't put values that were consistent with current estimates as the ones that done by Mark and collaborators uh, in here. So if we put these here, the effect that we see is of the order of 10%. That'll be a big effect, a big local 10% variation in the energy momentum distribution of the system. That's a big deal. This really puzzles me. The thing is that this is mostly controlled, uh, the equation of state and essentially all of those oscillations are mostly controlled by strong interactions. Weak interactions where the bulk viscosity appears, appears to be relevant on this uh, microsecond scales should be completely invisible. It's yeah. not like in neutron stars where you have this uh, bulk instabilities and stuff. Well, F mode, uh, R mode instabilities. This is completely different. I, I'm really still surprised that you're saying that would be obvious observables. Well, the point is that the, the damping time, if you compute this bulk viscosity due to these processes, the time scales of the order of milliseconds, if it's our order of milliseconds, that's exactly what we have. I mean, the question is, you, can, you, you could question whether the calculation itself done by market collaborators makes sense. Um, and you can certainly do so. Um, and uh, I'm not a specialist exactly on how they, they did all these different calculations, but from what I understand, what they find is something like this. This actually is uh, what happens to the, to the bulk viscosity that is actually seen in the merger. So those are the effects that we see. If those effects are true, it will have an effect. It will have a consequence. If it doesn't, then we actually learn what this mechanism is doing there. But there are other sources of viscosity. There is you know, thermal conductivity through neutrinos, there is shear viscosity through neutrinos. There is an effective shear viscosity that appears because you're doing a system in a differentially rotating system with a magnetic field, and then you have magnetic breaking. So there's a whole new thing that can be done. Um, so for example, if, once, if one has a code, you can study all of these things at once. Um, I think, um, at least I, I think it's fair to say that according to what it is, is known, like the state of the art for these calculations is this. Um, and this yeah. indicates that the effect should be there. So okay, uh, we could continue this offline, but for now, I would like to use this opportunity to thank you for a very nice presentation for so thank much you. interest created in the audience. So uh, thank you.